We thank you that nothing we do, we do ever on our own. Lord, even when we are far from you, we are ones in desperate need of grace, and yet we are created by a God who desires to give it and to bring our hearts to conviction of his glory through the good news of his gospel. And then, Lord, being uh, brought to life through the regenerating work of your Holy Spirit, through faith and belief in the gospel of Jesus, we are filled with your Holy Spirit so that in our darkest moments uh, and in uh, what seems to be times of greatest humanly success, we are always reminded that it is you who works in us both to will and to work for your good pleasure. And so as we begin a book uh, that has a strong verb in the title, Acts, that we would be mindful of the one who works and that we would understand our role, our mission, our empowerment, and our worship in the process. We pray all this in your name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever been swept up in a good story. My son just finished a uh, a couple series written by the same author, and he read those series over the course of a few short months. And he normally reads uh, in bed at night while he's trying to fall asleep. And he came up the next morning uh, noticeably distraught. He finished it all. There's no more books left to read. It was the end of the series. And he said, do you think he'll write another one? And I'm, I'm like, I don't know this guy at all. I don't know if he'll write another one. And so he went on with his day, and a couple mornings later, he came back up, and he had read the back pages of the books of all of them and all these various endorsements and small little snippets, and there was an interview with him, uh, and uh, a kid had written or a reader had written in and done a dialogue of Q&A, and he came up with this renewed sense of curious optimism. He said, read this, Dad. Read this. It doesn't, he doesn't say he's going to write another one, but he's also not saying he's not going to write another one. What do you think? And when we're caught up in a good story, when it grabs our imagination, we never want it to stop. Even secular figures over the millennia have found the story of Jesus Christ fascinating. Albert Einstein himself said, I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of Jesus Christ. And purely from a secular perspective, if you zoom out and you look at the effect Christianity, the response to the gospel of Jesus has had on politics and on cultures, it is uh, something we cannot miss. But theologically speaking, to believe what the Bible is presenting to be true, we see that the death and resurrection of Jesus, his ascension, vindicate his divine role and the reality of the hope the Bible offers. That all who are broken and sinful can come by grace through faith to Jesus Christ. And his death can become your life. Your sin can become his righteousness. And in him we have hope. What kind of hope? Living hope, historic hope, concrete hope. But for any of you who follow the story, for any of you who have been with us as we finished the book of Luke, it seems to have come to an end. Jesus is not here. He's left. He physically ascended. One of my favorite Narnia books is Prince Caspian, where the residents of Narnia have to grapple with what the world is like in what seems to be a post-Aslan culture. Aslan's gone. What does this mean? And today, as we begin the book of Acts, the disciples seem to ask themselves these very same questions. Right before Jesus ascends, we're watching his like waning moments on the countdown before he ascends up to the right hand of God the Father. They, in a sense, are asking, is this the end? Is the book over? Is there more? It's often said that the book of Acts, which is written by Luke, is a sequel to Luke's first book, the Gospel of Luke, which we spent the better part of two years working towards. And this is, in fact, how Luke introduces the book to us. If you look at Acts 1, verse 1, where he says this, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all Jesus began to do and teach. Now, 
There are two types of people in the world. There are those who are pessimistic like me and those who are optimistic maybe like you. And whenever a sequel comes out, we assume it to be not nearly as good as what happened first. It never lives up. It's not as good as the, origin, as the original. But this is why the book of Acts is so important for us today. It per, and to prepare us for this, to frame our minds for maybe false thinkings that you might have, as I might have, I want to open with just four introductory remarks on the book of Acts. And so we're not to the main point yet. I promise this isn't going to be two sermons, um, but we're going to start with some, some uh, introductory comments. So first, the book of Acts is essential to the Christian. The book of Acts is essential to the Christian. It is written by a Christian to Christians. Luke, the author, uh, was not only a close traveling companion with Paul, but he was also the early church's version of both Tom Brokaw and your grandma. He was the journalist and the scrapbooker. And he followed all of these things with both details, historic and relational. And from a mere literary perspective... No one has more words in the New Testament than Luke. In fact, when taken together, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts written by Luke constitutes nearly one-third of all the content we have in the New Testament. One fourth-century pastor was asked why Luke wrote two volumes instead of one, and he responded, for clearness and to give the brother a pause for rest. (laughs) It's a big work. But Luke didn't primarily write this book to be found in academic libraries. He wrote this book as like trade level paperbacks. This was for the people. This was to be cherished. It was to sit on your nightstand and to be thumbed through like my son spent his evenings reading these books. He addresses the books to a man named Theophilus, which in Greek means dear to God or lover of God. So for the Christian, this book is not merely history. This book is a memoir of the one who we love and the one who loves us in the gospel of grace. This is a book of facts, but it's also a book of love. Second, the book of Acts answers key questions regarding Christianity and the Christian life. Christian or not, this book has important answers to life's questions. If you're ever looking for a series to invite somebody to, this is the series. Now, hopefully that's true for every series we ever preach because people need to hear God's word. But listen to the important questions that maybe you're asking or your coworkers are asking or your neighbors. We hear people ask, who is Jesus? In Acts 16, verse 30, a pagan jailer in Philippi utters the most important question that we need answers to. What must I do to be saved? In Acts 2, Peter teaches the requirement of salvation, repentance, and belief. And then the response of salvation, baptism, and joining a church. What is a church? What are pastors? What does Christian community look like? How do we pray? How do we handle persecution? What is the message we share in evangelism? What is the means by which we grow in following Jesus? What is God's goal for all history? All of these are asked and found in the book of Acts. In this way, thirdly, the book of Acts explains the whole story of our life. It was written thousands of years ago, and yet we are still in this same chapter of God's work. What happens in the book of Acts is still in ways happening today. Why do we have life in the church? Why does God bring us new life through the gospel? so that we might glorify God and bring the message of salvation to the nations. Why do you have life in general, Christian or not? Well, Paul says in Acts 17 that we live and move so that you should seek God and find him. This is the story of our lives. But lastly, and most fitting to our passage today, number four, Acts reminds us that the work of Jesus is not done. The work of Jesus is not done. If you notice how Luke opens again in chapter one, uh, verse one, he doesn't say, in the first book, I shared with you all that Jesus did and taught, as if past tense. Notice what he says instead. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he has had chosen. And so if you spent time with us in the last couple sermons in the book of Luke, 
The first 14 verses of Acts deal with events that he already alluded to in the conclusion of the gospel. But now Luke is circling back in more detail, and he's sharing this in more detail so that we can see that though Jesus is about to ascend, though the gospel work of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection has been accomplished, Jesus is not done. Jesus is ruling and reigning, working and wooing the church by the power of the Holy Spirit for the joy and knowledge of the Father. This is Jesus' story. The book's not done. The sequel is not a knockoff. It's the same work carried on by the same person. The book of Acts is the same story of God's glorious plan, but it's a different chapter. The story of Acts, especially in these open chapters, is this, that everything is the same, and yet everything is different. And today's text will highlight what is the same and what is different compared to what we have seen and known in the Old Testament and even things that Jesus was talking about in the, the gospel accounts. And our main point is simple. It's just this. Jesus' story is not done and we're in the middle of it. And I would add that if you want to make sense of your own life, you better find yourself in it. But that's a longer title. So uh, Jesus' work is not done uh, and we're in the middle of it. The psychologist Carl Jung once said, the world will ask you who you are. And if you don't know, the world will tell you. You see, daily we are asked to justify our existence and our purpose to the watching world, to our social media followers, to our bosses, to our kids, and to our neighbors. And this is why Acts is so helpful for us. It gives us the answers that are true regardless of whether we believe them or not. For the, for the non-Christian, the book of Acts talks about who you are in need of redemption, and it offers you the wonderful grace of Jesus to come and to be redeemed according to his grace by faith. And for the Christian, the book of Acts then shows you and explains to you how when the world makes demands on your time, on your finances, on your passions, on your families, on your giftings, on your social media, on your automotive skills, on everything, it shows you for what purpose you were meant to have those things. It shows you how you might have peace in the midst of them. That on the basis of who you are in Christ, now your whole life is wrapped up in the purpose of Christ. So if we want to have peace amidst the pace of life, we need to see how our life fits not with our plans. Our plans got us into this mess. But with God's plan, the plan of redemption unfolding in the gospel. And that's what we see today in three parts in this text. We're going to see Jesus discussing this sameness and this newness in three ways. First, we're going to see the plan of God in conversion. Then we're going to see the plan of God in commission, the work that he's commissioning the church to do. And lastly, we'll see the plan of God in consummation, when Christ comes back home and consummates the finality of his kingdom. And our passage today uh, includes the 40-day teaching ministry of Jesus after he resurrected from the dead and before he ascends into heaven. And here Jesus emphasizes uh, the, our first point this morning, which is the plan of God in conversion. Luke opens saying this, what is Jesus doing during these 40 days? He presented themselves alive to them, those are to his disciples, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And so note, the first, the sameness. What did Jesus spend most of his time doing in the Gospels? Well, he spent most of his time, much of his time, performing miracles so as to vindicate that he was the Lord's Messiah. They were both proving and they were teaching. And what is he doing here after his resurrection? Well, he is providing proofs showing himself as the miracle. What do you need to see to be a Christian, to be convinced that God exists and has acted? You don't need to see water made to wine. You do not need to see a man walk on the water. You do not need to see a leper healed. You need to see that dead men come to life and that there is one man who has come to life for your sins and shall never die again. That's what we need to see. But then secondly, uh, in Luke 4, 43, Jesus describes his teaching ministry. And so his miracle ministry is vindicated in his resurrection. But look at his teaching ministry. Luke 4, 43. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God 
to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus' teaching ministry during his earthly life was to preach the good news, that word is the gospel, that's what gospel means, of the kingdom of God. Now here in Acts 1, the newly resurrected Jesus continues to preach about what? The kingdom of God. The fresh work of God is accompanied by the preaching of the historic message of God. It's almost as if you've hit the reset button on your computer, hoping that it'll start doing something differently. And yet having come back from the grave, Jesus returns to the task of talking, preaching, and teaching about the kingdom of God. You can't bump him off message. For Jesus, the gospel is synonymous with the kingdom. The gospel is the good news of what gets us into the kingdom. And the kingdom itself is the good news where we get to be with God. The good news of Jesus dying for our sins and taking away our imperfections is the gateway in which we get access to a God who is so holy and so just that he consumes imperfections. The gospel gets us there. But then the good news of the gospel is not merely that we no longer have sin, but it's that we get to enjoy the God of the kingdom. We get beautiful intimacy and life with him. You see, for many of us, as soon as we believe the gospel, we become zealous and eager to move on to what's next. I heard one person say, well, I'm a Christian. I know that God exists. I know that Jesus died for my sin. I've read the Bible before. What more is there for me here? What's next? And sometimes this often leads for us to kind of find secret Gnostic meanings in Scripture. Maybe we become a bit too preoccupied with prophecy or with numbers. Or perhaps we become bored altogether with what's in the Bible, and now we turn to the world, and we're asking the world's wisdom and the world's work to satisfy our soul and to bring us a sense of enjoyment. This was me once. Being a good type A Christian boy, I thought my tombstone would read, Tyler managed to somehow have a good time despite being a Christian. (laughs) And we're left wondering, what is there for us? But notice here, Jesus resurrected, vindicating the glorious work of God, does not introduce Christianity 2.0. He preaches the same message of being one to the same God. Only this time the gateway is clear. It is through the king. Here is how we get from kingdom criminals to kingdom saints. What was in black and white in the Old Testament because of the work of the cross is now in HD color. We don't see something different. We're seeing the same thing better. There's an old 17th century song that goes like this. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story softly with earnest tones and grave. Remember, I'm the sinner who Jesus came to save. Tell me the story always, if you would really be in any time of trouble a comforter to me. When it comes to discipleship, even as Daniel was praying this morning, how do we move toward others? If Jesus in resurrected glory did not move to comfort a confused and pre-spirit-filled church with something other than the gospel, I can promise you that you can move towards those who are hurting in your own church with this gospel. That knowing this what Christ has done to bring us into the kingdom of God, this is sufficient in a time of trouble. Do not get off message. Trust Jesus. The story of how God has brought broken sinners into his kingdom is the story that sustains, satisfies, and sanctifies sinners who are now saints by grace. Losing the dazzle of the kingdom of God, losing the dazzle of the gospel when you become a Christian is impossibly as tragic as getting married in hopes of finding joy and intimacy apart from your spouse. This is it. This is what gets us to God. God, to quote John Piper in a wonderfully titled book, is the gospel. There is no good news apart from God. There's good news in our lives apart from us all over the place. There's good news that exists that I don't even know of. But because God is eternal in himself, he alone is the good news who has acted to save sinners. 
But even though it's the same message, we now get to see in HD some new distinctions that were previously hidden in the black and white of the Old Testament. And this is where Jesus reveals this Trinitarian nature of the kingdom. Now we are seeing God work in new depth. We see this in verses four through five. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so notice Jesus' teaching on the kingdom is intimately connected with the Trinitarian work of God. How can we understand the kingdom of God? Well, we need to see the God who works. We need to see the God of the kingdom. And here we see that the kingdom is wrapped up in our, rest, our restoration to the promise of the Father through the work of the Son, or by the work of the Son, and through the sending of the Spirit. And the analogy Jesus is using here is baptism. Baptism with the Spirit. The symbolization of what the kingdom looks like and the kingdom work that they're waiting on is baptism with the Holy Spirit. Baptism was not a new idea for the Jews. This wasn't like, you know, inventing the wheel for them. John wasn't called Baptist for nothing. It had nothing to do with his tripartite illustrations in his sermons. Like he baptized people. That was a deep cut joke. Some of you got it. You could write me later. Um, he, he was baptizing individuals. They understood that baptism was a work that symbolized a desire inwardly to be made clean, to set apart our lives, to be washed. And John's baptism was specific in that it was a baptism of repentance. It was prophesying. It was a sign of which the substance was not the water of the washing, but the blood of Christ, which takes away our sins. And so at this point, if you put yourself in the disciples' shoes, it would have been really easy to think only in terms of what is the same. The classic rock band, The Who, uh, has a song called We Won't Get Fooled Again. And it concludes with them saying, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And the disciples could have easily thought, oh, here's the new thing. Baptize, John baptized with water, you'll baptize with the Holy Spirit. Like, but it, so it's a new thing, but it's the same thing. It's just, we're just doing different baptisms. Is that what's it? That's the big change. John baptized people, and now it's just a new baptism, like when a grocery store gets bought out and our membership card gets replaced with a new name, but it's the same card, it's the same coupon value, it's the same phone number that's attached to everything. And I wonder if when you've thought about Christianity or when you hear people talk about Christianity, if it's wrapped up in the same problem of sameness, that all Christianity seems to imply is the same person with new morals, or maybe the same model, but with a new paint job and some of the dings or scratches buffed out. But when Jesus is talking about baptism here, he's drawing our attention to the qualitative difference between the baptism of John and what's about to happen. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As we read this book, Jesus will command his, bapti his, his baptized to disciple. Uh, that's true as well. Um, but he will command his disciples to baptize those who repent and believe in water as a testament to them being brought to life in Jesus Christ. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here, is it? Jesus is not talking about any baptism by any human. And we know that because it says, John baptized. That's the first part of the verse. John is the actor. But then when you get to the second part in Greek, it says, you will be baptized. Who? By who? Who's baptizing these people? By John? No, he's dead. By each other? No, because Jesus would have instructed them of that. Who is going to be baptized? Or who is going to be baptizing? God is. They're going to be baptized by God, with God. On account of the completed work of Jesus, the believers are going to receive the promise of the Father by being baptized with the Holy Spirit himself. That is to say that the gospel does not merely make people wet. The gospel makes people new. The gospel converts us. Converts us not by changing who you are or how you act, but by filling you with God himself, by making you a new creation. Christians are converted. They're not gussied up from the outside, but they're made new from the inside. And 
wrapped up in this idea of conversion has always been this outpouring of the Spirit. Consider these words to a sinful Israel in Isaiah 44, verses 3 through 5. God says, For I will pour water on a thirsty land and the streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And they shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. So when the Spirit comes, it brings life to parched lands. And central to that life is what? Knowledge of God. I am the Lord's. Not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done to save me. And here in Acts, for the first time, in the fullest way, we're seeing God predicting that his people are not going to be marked off by physical circumcision, by voting parties, by uh, ethnic boundaries, or even by a preparatory spirit of repentance, not what they might do. But they're going to be marked off on account of their faith in the work of Jesus. They are going to be marked off by God himself. You don't become a Christian because you clean up your life. You become a Christian because God changes your life with God himself, by faith in God himself. Like water on parched ground, new life, eternal life will spring up. And the command Jesus gives us as the church to steward this baptism, we just baptized Cameron right here last week, that gives life to the mold growing under the carpet. (laughs) That gives life to no one. But it's meant to be what the, fit, the visible reminder of the spiritual reality of how God brings us life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how we are one to it by confession and faith. It testifies to the power of God to make sinners new by the work of the Holy Spirit. Christians are converted. But what does that even mean? What does that produce in you? Do you? Does it like elevate your dating profile? Like I, well, I wouldn't have one because I am me, but I, uh, you know, Chuck Norris, uh, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, love long walks on the beach. Like what, what do we do with this? Does it give us a, a cheat code to financial security? Does it give us front row access to things that happen here on the church? Does it allow us having changed up or, or changed our lives to kind of live For ourselves, if we're filled with God, then maybe I ought to be treated as God. But this is where the disciples' response draws us to consider how the reality of conversion, being filled with the Holy Spirit, is wrapped up in the responsibility of conversion, which is that we are now no longer living, though we have God in us through the Spirit. We are not living for ourselves, but we live for God. So we see here that conversion makes us into who we could never be, so that we could do a work that we could never do in order that the kingdom could be offered among those who have never heard. And this is our second point this morning. This is the kingdom plan in commission. The kingdom plan in commission. There's nothing more natural to us than to want to rest, than to want to be done. We were built to be done. We work to be done. That's all we want. And the disciples are hearing this. They're hearing that the Holy Spirit's going to come. They're hearing that God is doing this miraculous work. They knew that in the latter chapters of Luke, Jesus said these 12 apostles will sit and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. They've picked out their nice thrones. They went and sat and felt how squishy they all were. And they're waiting for what's next. And so they are ready for the time where now they get to sit and enjoy the kingdom of God. And notice how easy it is for us to slip into an understanding of the kingdom of God where we are the ones who are served and we are the ones who get to rest, but how God rescues us out of that by reminding us of his plan. Acts 1.6, they say this, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? John Calvin was a little harsh, I think, but funny nonetheless. He said, this sentence has more errors than words. (laughs) The question itself isn't terrible. Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. And because the disciples knew passages like Isaiah 44 that we just looked like, they knew that whatever was about to happen with the spirit 
was a sign that the kingdom of God was coming, at least in part, that it was being fulfilled in their midst. The disciples knew that God's promise in the Old Testament included a restoration of Israel's throne. The promise God made to Abraham to be their God and to be their people would be fulfilled even here on earth. But Jesus' answer to their question shows them that they were thinking uh, too soon of the kingdom and too small of the kingdom. In regards to being too soon, Jesus answers their question saying this, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And there's a reasonableness to their question, is now the time? We've been America since 1776. At the point of this writing, it's been nearly 1,500 years since God brought Israel out of Egypt and established them in the promised land. In that passing of time, Israel was only a united kingdom for 120 years under the reign of three kings. Only two of those kings were good kings. At the end of each of those kings' careers, civil war brewed and actually bubbled to the top. And so what they're longing for is something they have long been waiting for. They want the kingdom. And that's the beauty of God's kingdom for all of us. The kingdom of God is everything you've ever wanted. It's where you finally get to sit under a good king who rules directly over you, who protects you, who loves you, who satisfies you, and he keeps all pain, evil, suffering, death, and sadness safely outside the gates. Every longing you've ever had for something better is the whisper we have of the kingdom of God because we are made in the image of God. Our deepest hopes and longings remind us that we were made to be with God. God. But Jesus says, in regard to that longing, where everything is finally and perfectly fulfilled, not yet. This time period, he says, this is not the time period of full restoration. Jesus does the wise thing. If you've ever driven with kids or nieces or nephews, instead of letting them constantly ask, are we there yet? He just says the wonderful line, you'll know when we get there. (laughs) It'll be clear. No one will have to tell you. It'll be better than your life right now. (laughs) If you have to be convinced it's better, then it's not really better, right? The Father has fixed this time. In the meantime, trust the Father. And this is important for us because trusting the Father in a time where we have been spiritually renewed, but the kingdom of God has not been fully established, is a call for us to check our goals and our expectations, I wonder how many of our goals are to get kingdom rest now and that we're disheartened and we're frustrated when we can't seem to find that. Where we want to have heaven on earth today, where the longings of our hearts is that we can sit and we can enjoy this as if this is the end. But God's word and human experience both show that's a fool's errand. It leads to only frustration This world cannot satisfy us. The kingdom is coming, but it is not yet fully here to be enjoyed. But in the meantime, excuse me, in the meantime, he gives them the the power to wait and to work not only in light of that kingdom, but in line with that king. Did you notice that in Acts 1.8? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Have you ever labored really hard on a project or an assignment and you finally get it to the point of completion and before you even set it on your boss's desk or click submit, another one just lands on your desk or maybe even a revision to what you are about to turn in? That's a bit like what these disciples probably experienced, going from the question of endless, infinite enjoyment to Jesus now saying, you've got more work to do and it's going to take you to the ends of the world. But the wonderful promise of this work is that you will have the power to do it. That's why Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit. He will empower us to this task. Christianity is work, but it's work we were converted for. It is not work that saves us but it's actually the work that satisfies us. 
It's the work that we were built to do from the garden that sin corrupted, that redemption now recommissions us to do with God himself. We were designed to labor as witnesses for God's kingdom. That means when you feel tired, when you feel weary, when you feel at a loss for words, when you feel like you have nothing left, we are reminded by nature of our conversion, that we are filled with the endless, unwearied, all-sufficient spirit of God and church. He will provide. If we live according to our kingdom, we rarely get off the couch. But if we live in the power of God's kingdom, he carries us to the ends of the earth, not to enjoy the beaches of Tahiti, but instead to bring the gospel to those who do not have it. Jesus empowers us and sends us out. And it's here where we see that the disciples were thinking too small. They thought too soon. They wanted it now, but they were thinking too small. They wanted the kingdom restored to who? To Israel. When will we get rest in our name? That's the question. When is it like, na 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 boo boo we're Israel, we got the kingdom. But Jesus' response is actually, he shows them how and where they will work for his name, not for the name of Israel. We see that countless times in the Old Testament. I'm doing this not for your sake. I'm doing this for the sake of my name. God's promise to Israel was the door to the foundational promise that God made in the garden to bless and rule over all people through Jesus. Israel was always meant to be a signal to the nations, calling the lost of the world to see the goodness of their God. We see that as early as uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and then in Genesis 12, and in Genesis 15, and in Deuteronomy 4. That's why God made a promise to Abraham, so that the world might see in Israel the beauty of a God who's calling us to himself, and that to organize our lives around his grace is to realize the goodness of God. Of the kingdom. And so Israel's full restoration here, Jesus says, is wrapped up not in her commission to her own kingdom, but actually in her commission to the kingdom of God. Acts 1 8 is basically the literary structure of the book of Acts. If you want to know the, the table of contents for Acts, it's Acts 1 8. That uh, you'll wait in Jerusalem and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We can, we'll have, actually, as we preach through this, distinct markers along those lines. But Jesus and Luke here are not seeking to like write to these 21st century people and be like, hey, guess what? Here's a table of contents for the book. They could have just given us you know, a table of contents. They didn't, but he could have. But instead what he's doing with this is he's actually showing the Israelites how they're to understand the own way in which they'll be fulfilled. This is the story of the kingdom. The kingdom going global. It's a theological outline to how God restores Israel and how Israel calls all God's church to himself. And his commission here includes three specific allusions and quotations from Old Testament verses that are talking about what it's like when the kingdom is restored. In Isaiah 32, 15, God says that he will not restore Israel until the spirit is poured out on high. That's the first part of Acts 1, 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Isaiah 43, verses 9 and 10, God says that when Israel is restored, They will be God's witnesses to the nations. In Isaiah 49, 6, he says, Israel's restoration will be a light for the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Is now the time that you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? He's saying, no. And yes, it's happening. Right now, God is keeping his promise. Right now, converted, spiritually made new people are bearing witness to the God of Israel, calling them to come to him. And this conversion also immediately sets up the commission for us. We too no longer live to be king of our own kingdom. We no longer live for kingdoms far far too small to satisfy and kings far too weak to satisfy to save. All Christians who come to faith through Jesus are grafted into this promise and this commission. Our deepest joy, our national heritage, our peace is not found in bearing witness to our kingdom or resting in the kingdoms of the world. We are called to bear witness to Jesus's kingdom, to every nation across the globe by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is an ominous task. 
I can hardly tell all four of my kids it's time for bed in a reasonable time frame. <laughs> and here he's calling us to go and witness to his name to the ends of the earth. But this is the work of Jesus. He's the one working. He's working by the power of the Holy Spirit according to the promise of the Father in, through, and by his church. This, again, is what you were created and converted for. We're saved for the joy of knowing God and serving God. This is overwhelming. We cannot do it. But the gospel makes a way. The gospel has made a way for you to draw near to the God of glory, to come and stand before a holy and consuming fire and to not be consumed for our sins. Christ has taken your punishment. But now by merit of the gospel, people who are near to God draw near to sinners and they go at great lengths to do it. They leave no stone unturned. They leave no forest unexplored. They leave no people group unreached. And we cannot do that work, but God can. God will do it. I encourage you this week, keep a little journal of who you interact with. What's their age, their gender, their ethnicity, their nationality, their socioeconomic background, and notice the different spheres in which faithful evangelism can spread. And then know that by the end of this book, it's going to go greater. Prepare. I challenge you. <laughs> Prepare to share this gospel. In a strange work of God, I'm not a particularly gifted evangelist, but in the last month, God has set me in places where I didn't expect to be, <laughs> to share the gospel. And if that happened to me as I'm preparing, I pray that happens to all of us as we sit under this word. This is what he's called us to do. And because of that, we labor in light of a hope of enjoying all of what Jesus has done for us in eternity. We'll rest. Like Mike might be dying. We will rest there. And this is our final point this morning in closing. Just the kingdom in consummation. Verse nine. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, are you stupid? Why do you stand looking into heaven? It's just Jesus ascending. <laughs> Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. I love this image. As if seeing a resurrected Jesus was not confusing enough, now they see an ascended Jesus. John Chrysostom, a fourth century pastor, said it this way. He says, then that they may make no more inquiries, straight away he was received up. Jesus was done with their questioning and he left before they could have a follow-up. And this is so wonderful for us to see because there is a sense of you know, ignorance that the question of the angels have. Don't you understand this is what God was always going to do? And we laugh at it. But oftentimes we live outside of that. For many of us, how many times are our problems in life because we do not doubt? Or it are, are because we doubt that Jesus is coming back? <laughs> that we don't think he's going to do it. That we don't think he's going to return in the same way. Maybe we need to find a better way. Maybe we need to find a different way. Maybe we need to get what we can get on this earth because Jesus has forgotten. But the angels say, stop staring. He's coming back. You've got work to do. And remember, the disciples, as misguided as they were in their question, they got one thing right. The question was, when will you restore the kingdom? Jesus is doing the work right now. Jesus is working through you as the Holy Spirit works in you. He will come back and he will restore. When everything seems dreary and difficult, when we are so tempted to grab for us things that are on this plane, this earthly plane, remember, as Paul says to the church in Colossae, that we are to set our mind on things above. So when Christ appears we may treasure 
the Christ that has been in heaven the whole time. Jesus is doing a work, and because of that, it's not up to us to be fruitful. It's up for us to be faithful. You can't convert souls. You can't reach the nations, but Jesus can, and he's promised to do it through the church. Where can you look to see where God is doing today? I love this quote by Patrick Schreiner. He says this. He says, the church is not a side story to God's work in the world. It does not sit on the bench as the clock ticks on. Rather, the church is central to God's plan. If people want to be caught up in what God is doing in the world, then the stage upon which this play is unfolding is the church. The church is the hot spot where God works, where his glory is displayed. This is where God is working right now. This is where we live under a ruling, risen, and living king. But one day, the work that is now concealed in sweat and difficulty and sin and trials, it will be revealed in infinite glory when Jesus comes back. The next big day in the church, the next big thing, is nothing short of Christ coming back. These are the two events we're pinned between, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the King again. Every moment we have is latent with eternity. There's no more pit stops. There's no more gospel your neighbors need. There's no more vindication of a faithful God than what he's already given. And in the meantime, until Christ returns, we are to do this work and know that our rest, our joy, our satisfaction, our peace is right now in the spirit with the king. But one day the king comes back and we get to be in the kingdom with the king. Christ has come. We have tomorrow's news today. We know that everyone will be judged when he comes back again. But we have the privilege of bearing witness that Christ has come already. He has come to bring hope to the lost, relief to the sinner, and life to those who are dead. And so let us find our story in this story so that we might have a holy preoccupation with his work for the glory of God and the salvation of the lost. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you work all these things according to your will. We thank you that these things far too big, far too um, weighty, far too unimaginable, like the doctrine of conversion to understand, that we can know it as best we can with the faculties of our mind, but Lord, that we know it more firmly and more fully by the experience we have of taking you at your word of repenting and believing, being filled with the Holy Spirit and putting our hand to the work of mission, glory, and evangelism until you come back. May our church today look like the church you want us to be in glory through faith and repentance. We pray this in your name, amen.